welcome to the nerd party. Ah, oh, Miles here. Owl Post for the week is freshly delivered, and I am just one of the hosts here, Matthew Wushing, and of course with me, as she is always, the esteemed Drea Kaufman. What he means is the exhausted Drea Kaufman, <laughs> but esteemed, exhausted, it's all right. Small. I mean, it's all the it's same, right? Up there. You know, <laughs> We're right? all the same. Oh goodness. Well, uh, welcome. How's it going? Good little one's not sleeping very well, so it's been a rough, rough that week or two. Yeah. yeah, that is very hard. So, what about yourself? You have ex- you're taking an exciting trip, aren't you? Yes. Um, next week, uh, on Wednesday, head out to Chicago. One for the first time to visit Chicago, which will be exciting. But going to Star Wars Celebration, so of course, it has nothing to do with Harry Potter, but it'll be fun uh, to be out of town it'll be fun to visit chicago even though it's supposed to be chilly there but i'm going to be inside most of the time so it won't even matter so <laughs> yeah um, well i've been to chicago the second day of january and it was like negative three degrees so you'll be fine yeah yeah i i, I think it's supposed to be like mid 40s you know for the most oh, part see that'll be nice That's not bad you know so, um, but so super excited to do that. And, uh, you know, we just want to say too, thank you for so much for joining us here on our post. We're excited to have you with us. Um, don't forget you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. And, and if you're over on Apple podcast or iTunes, hit us up with a star rating and review, let people know what you think of the show uh, and help other people find the show by doing so. You can find us on Twitter at join nerd party, on Facebook at facebook.com slash the nerd party. And of course, if you would like to send us an email, you can go to the website at the nerdparty.com, then slash contact, choose a show, choose our post, and then Trey and I will get that email. We can talk with you that way. So we are finally at chapter 21, and some big things are going to happen in this chapter to really set the rest of the book in motion. The eye of the snake. I got to say though the beginning of this chapter picks up a little bit on the humor from the last chapter and continues to roll with it and i really enjoyed the beginning of this chapter with ron harry and hermione and the snowballs being boy being jinxed to fly the (laughs) at the tower at gryffindor tower as they're trying to do their homework and i like that ron's all like i'm a prefect i'm gonna get whoever's doing this and he's like oh it's fred and george never mind that was pretty awesome well and i i i think it's funny because you know hermione's going to try and talk to hagrid and the boys can't go because they have way too much homework to do which is pretty classic for them and so i really appreciate when they come back when she comes back and she, she, they're like how did it go did did you get did you plan all his lessons and she's like he wasn't really listening to me all that much. <laughs> well, and he was late, right? Like he mm-hmm. came out of the forest and she was saying that she was worried because, you know, he didn't look any better than he did yesterday and he still won't talk about it. She didn't really make much progress. You know, she tried to convince him that grubbly planks like pre done agenda um, or syllabus is probably the best way to go. And just to follow that and, you know, and he'll be fine. Um, she seems to think he doesn't understand what's happening. Yeah, which, you know, makes sense. Um, and it's really interesting because she is setting up this mystery here of, of what's going on with Hagrid. And it will take a few chapters for us to kind of get to a place where we get an answer to that. But it also, you know, it, it's something I was thinking about when I was reading this chapter was we do have... Hagrid being somebody who is very much in tune with the magical creatures and loves them in a way that most other, you know, wizards don't even love them. And I really like the way that that plays with what we see, especially in the Fantastic Beasts series, where people in the magical world 
have very much the same thought process then you know they're they're not in tune with magical creatures they don't like magical creatures for the most part um and you know they kind of think of them as something that that needs to be eradicated almost and and Hagrid is is so much more on the newt side of this and I think you know it's it's very interesting to see that type of character because we even see that attitude with the different kids who come to Hagrid's class in the care of magical creatures and the way that they interact with this. Um, and it's interesting to see Hermione be somebody who's so interested in kind of trying to protect Hagrid here. And it's again, it's not so much about magical creatures. It's about her friend Hagrid. Um, and yet, I think the what Hagrid represents attitude-wise is something that's so important. Um, and it's definitely playing into all of the different ways in which prejudice play out in the wizarding world and you know we still see that people have a lot of prejudice against something like magical creatures especially the ones that they don't understand and or aren't willing to learn anything about that you know have these weird superstitions around them which we actually get to in this chapter with the thestrals yeah i i think you've summed that up really nicely i think it's interesting um how much like how much he cares about them and how much he sort of gets them and and to the extent that he sort of others don't and others can't. And and yeah, we'll definitely see that play out here as we meet uh, the Thestral, the Thestrals. And as Harry realizes that he's not crazy. I did really like that, that, you know, the moment that Harry sees these, weird horse skeleton like beings he's like i'm not crazy hagrid could see them too like his he's just so excited for this fact that that he can see them and that other people can see them as well even though i think there are only three people in the class that can see them which is still a lot and we finally learn why harry is one of the few people that can see them yeah, we learn a little bit more about them and why him and Luna are the ones that can see them. Um, and who we find out the other one who can see it is Neville. And I really, I, I thought that was really interesting. And it, it, it creates, I don't know, there, there's something about like introducing um, some a creature like this. And I, I just thought it was really fun. And I appreciated the... Um, just the creativity of creating something like this, you know, and it it makes sense why there would be kind of a stigma around them because, you know, if you can only see them because somebody's died, it makes sense. why It's not because someone's died. It's because you've seen somebody die. Right. Which is, which is horrifying all of its own, let alone to be reminded or given special talents, if you will, because of this horrible thing that's happened to you, you know? Right. Which I, I, you know, I kind of wonder, do you think that Rowling is kind of going for the idea that even though somebody is gone, when we're talking about death, like death doesn't have to be something that um, we look at as being awful. And therefore, like you can you can have something good can come from it. I don't know. It, it just seems like I'm wondering because the whole series is obviously, you know, she said is about death. And so I'm kind of wondering what the Thestrals then represent in that. Mm, that's a fair question. I never took it as you can get something good from it. Um, I think she does play with death throughout the series in, in many ways. And when we kind of get closer to the end, we can we can talk a little bit more about those because that comes a much more... Um, apparent theme but i feel like what she did with the thestrals is she sort of created like a club Mm. and it's more of a coping thing like you're not alone others can you know this is sort of like if you can see it it creates this bond with others who can see it that nobody else can understand just like when you experience seeing someone die or experiencing the loss of a close loved one like not just anyone can understand what you're going through and what that's like. Um, so I, I kind of took it more like that. Um, more like you've kind of got this past to this special club that nobody really wants to belong to. Um, and that anybody not in the club can't understand. Um, and I kind of, I kind of read it that way too, because that's sort of how Harry's felt from the very beginning. Um, 
Ron and Hermione just don't understand him for a good half of this book or more. Um, they can't understand what he's going through. They don't know what, you know, what it's like. Um, and I, I kind of took it like that too. Like they can't see the festival, so they can't, you know, he thought, he thought it was crazy for a long time. I'm, because the only other person he knew who could see them was Luna, um, who surprisingly is not there for this because they have care of magical creatures with the Slytherins and she's in Hufflepuff. Oh, she's in Ravenclaw? Ravenclaw. She's in Ravenclaw, yeah. Uh, she's she's a she's a Huffleclaw. Um, she's in Ravenclaw. Um, and uh, so the, she's not there for them to learn, but you know, you learn about Neville and who he's seen die. Um, and just it creates a bond because now Harry knows that he's been through that and Neville knows about Harry and like, there's just that level of things you can relate to. So that's how I kind of always read the thrust rolls mm. um, as, as they give you a, a common bond that nobody wants to have, but now at least you can relate to. Yeah. I, I really like that. It reminds me of something um, strangely enough from Grey's Anatomy um, where one of the characters dad dies and they're having a conversation with the other character and they said, you know, welcome to the dead dad club, you know, like, and you can't be in it unless you're in it. And you can't explain what that's like to anyone unless you're in it. And I think you're absolutely right here. You know, you can't explain the impact of what it means to watch somebody die. And, you know, that impact can be the kind of impact that Harry watching Cedric die, like sudden and awful and violent. And it can be other ways too. You know, there, there are different ways that you can watch somebody die. You could watch somebody die peacefully, you know, and, 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 and it can have a completely different impact on you. So with the impact of death always has an impact and it's, it's hard to explain that impact to somebody else who hasn't experienced it. So I think you're right on track with, I really like that. I think that's a really great way to, to look at it. And, I think you're right. It does create a an interesting club here as we will find, you know, that you've got Harry and Neville who have this connection now that that may blossom in this book. Um, and we'll find out some other people who have this connection as well. Obviously, Luna, we already know, can see them too. And so we'll, I, I think it'll create a, an interesting dynamic between you know harry and luna as well so uh, moving well, forward i think we're overlooking a big one hagrid yeah hagrid too Hag yeah you're absolutely hagrid right can see them and mm -hmm. we don't we just she sort of rushes past that but for him to be able to explain what they are and see them and and tame them he has to be able to see them so clearly he had to have seen someone die um and and we sort of overlook that but that's a big part of this too is she's developing hagrid's character even further because he's chosen He's chosen this care. I feel like he's chosen this creature very specifically for the circumstances that they are in. Um, there, I feel like there's something about this mon this this beast. I don't want to say monster. This beast that he's chosen that he needed to convey something to them to Harry probably specifically at this point in this sort of like this horrible situation that's that keeps getting worse and worse and worse as time goes on he needed to share something and he chose this one um so i thought that was very unique too and, and the fact that you know we now learned a little bit about hagrid too yeah that's a really an good point i think you know we we do you kind of gloss over and it makes it interesting that and it makes it, me wonder if that's maybe one of the reasons that there's a connection between Hagrid and Harry, you know, that Hagrid's always had with Harry, is that he's experienced some of these things that Harry has, which is, you know, losing family um, and, and not really having a sense of family, and except for coming to Hogwarts where this is home and having that feeling. And so you, you really see the connection between those two characters, which is, I think really important you know and and the ways in which she's able to take these different characters and put them in groups which you don't necessarily expect to have and i think that's one of the things that this book does really well is it begins to as we mentioned i think earlier um we we've talked in previous episodes about this this sense that the core group is expanding in a little bit and one of the ways that she expands this is by making connections between characters in their their deepest most heart-wrenching moments um, that they share together 
for different reasons, like, like, you know, having watched somebody die, that will bring somebody like Neville into the fold um, of this, this, you know, group of Ron, Harry, and Hermione, that it'll get a little bit bigger. And so I really, I think this is just one of the ways in which she's able to do that, and it creates a, a larger but more in, involved core group than just the three you know we we move out from a trinity to other characters too which is really cool that that's happening in this book well and i think she's also showing like that there's more than harry who sort of had to grow up beyond his years Mm -hmm. right like there's neville there's luna there's all these other characters that have this like similar thing i mean it's not the same exact scenario but it has had a similar effect and then it's forced them to cope and deal and grow up and be an adult much faster than they should have to be and so those are the people who don't care so much about the petty things they're the they're the people who have are more what i like to think of as like salt of the earth people right um and so i feel like she is slowly showing us how that's the case and, and who those people are um to make not just like expand that trinity, but to really deepen those relationships because it's going to be so important that everything he does is going to become so important as the story continues. Um, just like it is in the real world. Like it's so important to make those deep and meaningful con- connections with people and have, I mean, you've got, there's a time and a place for all your different friend types, but there's those, those, there are those ones you need that just get it and, who, who are there and you have to be able to rely on them. So she she's doing a great job of doing that with kids and, and showing you what is most important. And and as a parent, showing me what I want to teach my daughter when she grows up, not that she should have to go through something like this, but that, you know, that there are people that are deep and meaningful even when they're, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, because these are not new experiences right. they're having, you know. Neville's granddad passing isn't like something that happened last year and all of a sudden he's a changed person. Like he's had to deal with that the entire time, especially what we know of his parents. He's had to deal with that the entire time he's a kid. So, um, you know, I, I love it's sad and, and kind of melancholy, but um, it's even worse that we have Umbridge here to weigh in on situation and she's not being shy about her thoughts and feelings and twisting what's happening and, and, you know, Hagrid starts to engage a little bit, but for the most part, he does a pretty good job of keeping a a level head, which is surprising for him. Um, he's a little bit like Harry too. He's got a little bit of a a temper. Yeah, and it's it's frustrating because you know everything we're learning about Thestrals here is is that they really are amazing creatures. We're learning, you know, about how they have an amazing sense of direction and, you know, how Dumbledore will even use them if he's traveling long distances. I mean, they're just incredible creatures. And then, you know, she just comes in and kind of ruins this whole lesson um, by making fun of Hagrid at every turn possible after she asks him a question, you know, taking it completely the wrong way. And I have to love so much, and I do love so much, how Hermione is just so incensed at this, you know, like under her breath, she says loud enough for Ron and Harry to hear, you hag, you evil hag, like you, you awful, twisted, vicious, like she just keeps going on and on about it under her breath. And it's interesting, like you said, Hermione being the one who's so incensed, whereas Hagrid takes this very well, like he just... He answers the questions that she has, and then he moves on, continues with his lesson. He just almost forgets that she's even there. And I just really kind of appreciate the way um, he does that. I think it's really it's really well done. You know, Hagrid uh, takes it upon himself to not let her bother him, you know. Uh, and she twists what he says to her own means. Um, and you know, there's uh, it, what I think is great about Hagrid's response to all this is that you, you can't do anything about that, right? You can't do anything about the way somebody takes what you say and then twists it, you know, you can only do what you can do. Well, and I get the impression he seeing as he's like not supposed to do magic and almost got kicked out of Hogwarts and all of that. And, and I feel like he's used to this. Like Umbridge is not treating him any differently than he's used to being treated, right? Some of the other teachers haven't had to experience that. So it's harder for them, like Trelawney. But like for him, I feel like this is just how everyone treats him all the time. And he's just like, I 
I can't do anything about it. I'm not going to engage. There's like, there's no point. This is not new for him. So he just lets it roll off his back. And I think that's an important thing for Harry to see. I think it's important for Harry to see like that, like there's nothing Harry can do about it. (laughs) He's got to let some of this roll off his back and know that it's not real. So don't engage. Um, so I think that it's an interesting situation and it's another moment where we see that the unique sort of thing that Hagrid brings to the table. Well, and it's, it is frustrating to, you know, um, how they're, of course, she's using the, the Slytherins here to be the ones that really answer her questions. And of course they're going to twist everything in, in bad ways. And then she, of course, twists what Neville has to say and, she knows exactly what she's doing to get what she wants, quote unquote, um, to be able to use it as a weapon against Hagrid. And, you know, as Hermione says when they leave, like for an, a lesson from Hagrid, this was actually a really good one, you know. And um, there's a there's a quick moment there, which I thought was really interesting, where Hermione's like, man, I wish I could see them. And Harry's like. Do no, you? you don't. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. That was the dumbest thing to say. And I just really liked that moment because Hermione looks struck like with horror at what she said. And Harry's like, "It, it's okay. It, don't worry. You know, like he, he gets it that she doesn't pick, like realize what she's saying. And it's one of those moments where like, you know, Harry could have kind of blown up at somebody because they said something really dumb and instead Harry doesn't you know he just he kind of mirrors what we saw Hagrid doing which is just kind of rolling with something and just letting it go and I thought that was really big of Harry in this moment um because it almost feels like too you know Harry has other things to be thinking about here <laughs> um and this this is this is not something to get angry about you know it, it, and he he's able to let it go you know that's that's that shows a maturity here where you know we've seen hang, harry getting angry a lot in this this book when maybe he should have been letting some things go and this is a moment where he really just does and it's great i agree and surprisingly this is not actually the biggest moment in the chapter like this is a pretty intense chapter actually um we we move on and hear how he's sort of upset about Christmas coming up and normally he looks forward to staying at Hogwarts for Christmas but this year he's not looking forward to that so much um, he's sort of bitter with everything that's going on and and then uh, Ron drops some pleasant news on him yeah this was great where Ron's like oh I'm sorry did I did I forget to tell you mom was like you're coming back to the house with us and Harry's like goes a complete 180 he's like there, there's like a a switch that flips. Like, oh, that's that's awesome. Like, I'm so glad, you know, because you can you can feel for him this thought of like being at Hogwarts is going to be awful while everybody's gone, and then to realize no, he's being taken care of by his friends and their family. You know, there's there is not much better when you feel like people care about you, and that's really what Harry's getting here. He feels like people are there for him and he starts to wonder if he can maybe convince uh mrs weasley to send Sirius to to Mm, invite Sirius over too um and then he's like well maybe not yeah and that's gonna be something that'll be interesting to see if that does happen at christmas if he'll be able to get a chance to see Sirius because he would really like to um and and not just for himself but he would like to for his you know, Godfather not to have to spend Christmas alone, you know, with Creature, which, you know, who would want to do that? I don't really know. So <laughs> that's considerate of you. <laughs> that's very considerate of Harry. I love when he gets into the room of requirement and he can tell that Dobby has decorated because there's a tree and there's a big sign saying, you know, have a very happy Christmas. And uh, <laughs> Luna is the first one to come in and she's like, oh, look, mistletoe. It's, it's I'll bet it's infested with nargles. And Harry's like, what? what well, that like that he, it's because he jumps out of the way because he doesn't want to be under the mistletoe with Luna. And she's like, oh, good call. You're getting out of, you know, 
these are usually infected with nargles. He's like, yeah, sure. That, that's why I did that. <laughs> like He's trying to be so considerate, but at the same time, he can't help himself from not wanting to be under the mm-hmm. mistletoe with Luna. Well, this is where, yeah, as the people start to trickle in, some of the people from the Quidditch team, and of course, Terry hasn't been able to play Quidditch, and he finds out who he's been replaced by, which is Jenny Weasley. Which is awesome. It is pretty awesome. It is pretty awesome. It, it is pretty awesome. And they have two new beaters as well. You've got Andrew Kirk and Jack uh, Slopper, which I thought it was interesting. The last name Kirk is also the same spelling in the last name of Diggory Kirk from the Chronicles of Narnia series, who is the first one chronologically to have gone to Narnia because he was there at the creation of Narnia. So I'm wondering, um, and is also the professor then in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So I'm kind of wondering if she used that last name as a, because I know that she likes C.S. Lewis's series. So I'm just wondering if she used that as a a reference point. So Interesting. Yeah. But uh, it's really fun because, you know, they have a great lesson. Um, They're not really learning anything new, but they're all practicing things that they have been, you know, learning throughout the entire term. And and Harry's getting a chance to see everybody who's really improved. Neville is improved. He thinks beyond recognition. He's actually able to stun somebody. And I love it. It's great. It's great. And and Harry is feeling a real sense of pride in all of that. This lesson goes really well. Everybody does a great job. And then he's, you know, sending everybody home and telling them Merry Christmas. And he kind of gets cornered by Cho as everybody's leaving. And they have one of the most awkward moments in the series. <laughs> So she starts kind of like asking him about Cedric and then realizes that like she's just trying to make conversation and she doesn't really want to ask him about Cedric, but she already did. And then Harry is uncomfortable because, you know, he was there when Cedric died and then all of this stuff. And it's just like, and then at the end, all of a sudden she like kisses him, but it's like, weird and full of tears and that's it (laughs) yeah it's 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 kind of the most awkward way you can get your first kiss by you know having the girl that you've liked forever have her boyfriend die in front of you the summer before and now she's kind of like in this limbo place of she likes you but all this has happened and yeah, you know, I I can't imagine that this is the best way to... I mean, when you imagine having your first kiss with somebody, uh, even as a guy, this is not the way that you imagine that happening. So, and I feel so bad for Harry to, to have this be his first experience. And, of course, he gets back to the common room and he's talking about it with Ron and... Hermione. And Ron does not make him feel better at all. Like, she was crying... Are you he that bad at kissing? He, doesn't even, he starts off by saying he didn't even know if he wanted to tell them. Right. Because it was so awkward and he didn't know what to think about it. She's like, I don't even know if I'm going to say anything. And then Hermione is just like, did she kiss you? And he's like, what? And it's like, oh, well, she likes you. And he's like, what? <laughs> like the whole thing. She's so direct and to the point and matter of fact and doesn't like sort of dance around it and and i love that they kept true in the movie to the what happens here where she describes like everything that cho is probably feeling um and you know ron's response is like nobody can feel all of that at the same time they'd explode and she goes just because you have the emotional capacity or capability of a teaspoon doesn't mean that everyone else does um and i just love that little exchange because what she's describing is probably real and it is, I think, a difference between teenage boys and teenage girls of how overthought, like she's overthinking this drastically. Um, and I, I think, I just think it's so funny. It's so funny. Well, and I think it, you know, what she says makes complete sense about why Cho is feeling like this and why there is this, you know, why it isn't kind of the just classic teenage romance experience you know all these things have happened to both of these characters that you know they have have a they've we've known 
from him asking her to the ball that there was a connection there, right? That that she did want to go with Harry, but she had already been asked. And so therefore it created a relationship there with Cedric, but she had had a, you know, it seemed like there, there had been a connection there. And, and now this connection that they still have is clouded by, you know, and awfully clouded by the death of her previous boyfriend. Uh, you know, it throws a whole bunch of cold water over this whole thing. And, and so I absolutely just adored this whole conversation. You know, Hermione is so matter of fact about it. Well, you know, did you kiss, you know, did you get kissed and all that and, and explaining the well, whole are situation. Are you going to call her? Are you going to see her Yeah, again? exactly. And, and Harry's just having a hard time kind of thinking about all of this. And, you know, I think what I love about this thing, too, is that you get this sense, like, Hermione has two parents at home, right, who care about her and love her, and I'm sure they've had these kind of conversations together about boys and relationships and all that kind of stuff. Harry doesn't have any of this, right? And he doesn't have any sense of what this is going to be like. He hasn't had anybody to talk to him. He hasn't had the talk, you know. And, you know, with Ron, it's like he grows up in a house full of brothers or whatever, and they get teased about all this stuff, I'm sure, all that happens and you know i'm sure he's kind of probably had this conversation with his parents or whatever but he wasn't really paying attention because that's just kind of ron's personality um but you do i really do feel sorry for ron i mean harry in this situation because harry hasn't had anybody to kind of show him the ropes whatsoever you know and so he's caught between a hermione and a ron place where it's like Hermione is just literal and matter of fact about it, and and Ron doesn't get anything at this moment, and it, it's well, not and the I best think, place to be. I think the Weasleys are great parents, but Mrs. Weasley doesn't strike me as someone who's going to sit Ron down and talk to him about yeah women and feelings and how that how to how to work this and and how to handle his own feelings and what to do in these situations. Like she's very overprotective and. Um, you know, her job is to protect her kids from getting hurt. And I feel like she capitalizes on that more. And this is maybe one of those areas where not having those conversations can be detrimental, even if you're trying to protect them. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just so funny. And, and, you know, they, they go to, Hermione goes to call it a night and she's been writing and finally Ron's like, who are you writing that novel to? Because the whole time she's been writing while kind of interrogating him and finds out that she is still in correspondence with uh, our our one and only favorite international Quidditch player, Crumb. Which I absolutely adore the conversation between Ron and Harry after she goes to bed. And he's like, why, why do you think he even... You know, she even likes him. And Harry's like, well, I mean, he's older. He's an international Quidditch star. And Ron's like, yeah, but aside from that, he's really grouchy and a git. And, he, and Harry's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, super grouchy. But he's not really into this conversation because he's still thinking about <laughs> Cho. <laughs> yeah, he's still thinking about Cho. So and then we sort of go to bed and. Yeah, that we go to bed and then Harry starts having dreams. And the dream we get is first he's having kind of a nightmare about the whole Cho situation, but then it moves to him as if he's a snake and he's along this corridor and he's watching somebody and he then uh, that, that person wakes up and he the snake didn't want to attack that person, but now that this person is awake, he does attack the person and bites them like three or four times, like three times. And then he wakes up and everybody's like, Harry, Harry, are you okay? Like he's apparently woken up his entire dormitory. All the boys are thinking he's having some sort of fit. And Harry is just like, no, Ron, your dad has been attacked. Your dad has been attacked. And they're like, Harry, it's just a dream. You're going crazy. And he's like, no, Ron, it's your dad. I saw it happen. And luckily they get Professor McGonagall. McGonagall comes in and he, he she just keeps saying the same thing. It wasn't a dream. I have to Harry Ron's dad, he's been attacked. And she's like, Potter, I believe you. Put on your dressing gown or go into the headmaster. And then it ends. It's like it is a very intense end to this, this chapter. And it's like dun 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 and keep it's reading. Pretty much it is. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> 
I think like I just it is one of those places where she's done such a good job where you just want to turn the page to get to the next chapter. But we have to wait for chapter 22. I'm sorry, folks. Um, Yeah, I'm as heartbroken as you all are. Don't worry. Don't worry, guys. We're going to get there. But, uh, you know, before we do that, Drea, you know, if anybody wants to talk about this chapter or anything else that's going on Harry Potter wise or what's going on in life, uh, where can people find you? Sure. You can find me on Twitter at PCF Chick or on Instagram at Drea Kaufman and it's C-O-F-F-M-A-N. And you could find me here on the network. I am uh, doing aggressive negotiations with John Mills as we talk all about Star Wars each and every week. I'm uh, here on Twitter and Instagram and Letterboxd under Mount Rushing 2 You can also find me on the Trek FM network doing two shows. One is called The Orb with Chris Jones talking about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, we'll also do the 602 Club, which is the general geek show with uh, Christy Morris. We dive into all of the fandoms that we love, not just one. And then last but not least, I do a show called Cinema Stories with my good friend Courtney. And that's where we talk about films through the ones of faith. But we want to say thank you so much for checking your outpost. Mischief managed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.